Welcome into other people's shoes. As you know, I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you so much for joining me today. Super excited about today's guest. But before we get to her, just a little fun stuff to talk about. Fun stuff being, if you haven't already, jump right over to OPSpodcast.com. That, of course, is an amazing place where you can hear past, present, and future episodes. You can also be a part of the show, which is kind of fun. You can leave a comment there, and we would, of course, love to hear your comment and maybe even read one on the air. And, of course, you can also leave a voicemail there, which we, of course, would love for you to do as well. Speaking of things we love, you can jump right over to your favorite social media of choice, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can follow us under the handle OPS Podcast Show. A little different than the website, but kind of the same. Speaking of things that are different, you guys might think of me as kind of a little different. Well, let me tell you a little different thing that has gone on the last three years around here. You might remember this. We had a map, and we still have said map, in the studio. And every time we have a guest come on, whether they're international or in the United States, we put a pin in a map representing where they're from. Well, for the longest time, we have yet to have this state. And today, I'm, I'm kind of excited. We get to cross a state off of our list of states, that of course being Mississippi, M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I, Mississippi. I think I spelled it right. Check me on that. But today we get to cross off Mississippi off our list. And I'm super excited to introduce you to this young lady. In fact, let me do that now. She is the founder and president of End It For Good, a nonprofit doing education and advocacy towards a health-centered approach to drugs and addiction. After several years of working for a tech startup and a few years of being a mom raising her boys, she decided to start End It For Good after her experience as a foster mom convicted her that the criminal justice system was the wrong tool to use for drugs and addiction. Help me welcome her in from the great state of Mississippi, Christina Dent. Christina, how are you today? I'm doing great, Neil. I'm really excited to be with you. Awesome. Now, I know you've been on a number of our friends' shows. Eric Nevins is one that comes to my mind because he's a great mentor and a great friend in our life. Now, I know you've been halfway there. It's the name of his show, so trying to be funny there. But you've never truly really walked in other people's shoes, have you? No, today is the first day. <laughs> but I think you have Just not in, in some your shoes, respects. Neil. Today is the first time in your shoes. Yeah, which is dangerous. As we said in the green room, it could, it could get dangerous. If I were to look up the word empathy in the dictionary... I think your name might be mentioned there. Yes or no? Mm, that's a great compliment. I hope it would be. I think that has been a, a place where I have grown an awful lot over the last few years. And I'm so thankful for that growth. And I hope that growth continues. Yeah, because I think, and, and really the whole reason why my wife, I think, told me to start this show was one, I needed a verbal outlet. But two, I think when we started brainstorming her and I about what the show was going to be and kind of the, the essence of it, she said, you know, I think people need empathy. What do you think? And I was like, wait, what's, what's empathy? And she's like, well, you know, it's like understanding where they come from and having that, that place of like, oh, I've been there too. And, and I can kind of rally around that. And I just think to me in this day and age, we need more people rallying mm -hmm. around each yeah. other, mask or no mask. I mean, I don't care about that, but I think we need more people just saying, Hey, let's have a conversation yeah, absolutely. about where you've been. So, so we did eliminate a number of seasons back that we stopped asking ladies their shoe size because apparently in the South and, and you, you're a Mississippi girl, true and true from what I understand, like from birth till now. Absolutely. So it is, it is, help me with this still, because it's bad etiquette in the South to ask someone their shoe size, right? Yeah, that would be. Good call on that. Yeah, our, our good friend Misty Phillip told us that we can't we can't do that anymore. <laughs> that it could offend, and so I don't ever want to offend. So we'll just we'll just stick with what style of shoe do you like to wear? How about that? Oh, that's a good one. I love a little wedge. So I'm tall. I'm five ten. So I cannot do like. A tall heel that's just it just doesn't work so i love a little wedge that's a little bit fun but 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 nothing that puts me over six feet now why uh, silly question from a guy standpoint why don't you as a lady want to be over six feet i don't understand well i'm already tall like i i got tall early in my life too so i was like always the tallest person you know in my grade age in the youth group i was homeschooled so it wasn't in my school but among my friends it was like i was just always tall and so i come from a tall family i'm like the shortest person in my family Family. My brothers are, you know, six one, six three, six four, and so it just was like, you know, I, I just don't want to, I 
don't want to stick out anymore. I'm already kind of tall. That's okay. I, I love the tall, love being tall. I just don't need to be taller than tall. I'll just stick with tall. All right. Now here's a, here's a personal question. Maybe is your husband really tall or is he, are you taller he's than six him? One. Or, no, oh, he's six see, one. Yeah. Okay. See my wife, she'll, she'll punch me for this probably, but she's five, eight, five, nine. I'm going to give her five, nine. And I'm like six, three with shoes on. I might be pushing six, four, depending on, you know, which shoes, which hundred and no, right. 180, <laughs> which 80 pairs of shoes I choose to wear that day. So wedges. Okay. I sort of can get around that. I always love it when girls give me weird shoes to try to try on. Cause I'm like, I don't know if I could walk in wedges. I yeah. look like a, <laughs> was that like Bambi on the ice? Like that's what right, I feel like. Totally, I, don't, I totally. don't know. All right. That's a visual people didn't necessarily want, but there it is. Well, awesome. As I mentioned, you know, you were on Eric's show, you were talking about foster son Beckham. And to me, when I heard that story back, and so people can go listen to that, that's Eric's show halfway there. What I loved about that story that you were sharing is I really think there was a shift in empathy in your heart about that. Now, we'll set that up. Is he your first foster kid or, or is he your like second? How, how does he fall in there? Yeah. So my husband and I started fostering when our two children were four and six years old. And we kind of thought about adoption, but just didn't really feel any leading. We really wanted to feel like God's really leading us in a particular direction for this. And we didn't really feel that. And so we ended up deciding, you know, we'll foster for a little while. We'll, we're trying to figure out this adoption thing. And so we started fostering. Our our first foster son um, came to us in 2014 and he was an infant and I was homeschooling my older boys. And it was all I could do to have just one more little baby in the house. So for 18 months, we said no to all other placement calls. We got them all the time, but we always said no. And then uh, when my youngest was 18 months old, then got another call and he called me. I can still be like standing outside with my boys you know, a cold day in December. We live on a cul-de-sac. They were out, you know, raising whatever <laughs> out in the street. <laughs> and my husband calls and says, you know, okay, just listen to this. I don't, okay. I just got a call from a social worker and they have uh, a baby that needs a foster family. And I don't know why, but I just feel like we're supposed to say yes. And I was like, well, that's easy for you to say. Cause you go to work every day from eight to five. I'm the one who's here with all these kids and homeschooling and cooking and cleaning and all the things like, yeah, I bet you do feel the Lord calling, but I don't. And I'm the one who's here that's doing most of the work. And he said, look, let's just, let's just talk about it. Like, you know, I, I just have this strong feeling. And he had never said that before 18 months of, of calls that, that were not that. And so I said, okay, well, you know, how old is the baby? I don't know. I didn't think to ask that. And, you know, he didn't know anything about it. He just felt like, you know, I'm supposed to say yes. So anyway, I said, okay, give me the, give me the social worker's number. Let me call and get some info. So I did. And he was coming straight from the hospital and his mom had been using drugs while she was pregnant. And so he was removed from her custody and put in foster care. He had been in the NICU for a number of weeks. He was born early and was just getting released that day. And so I asked the social worker, what are you going to, what are you going to do if we say no? Like who's the, the next person. And she said, well, I mean, I don't have anybody, but we'll just keep looking. And so I, I called my husband back and, and I started thinking, and you know, this is just such a cool thing about the way that God works. So this was early December and normally December is just like crazy. And I have all these plans to get all my Christmas shopping done early and all my Christmas cards sent out and it never materializes. Like my plan is always to get it done before Thanksgiving, never materializes. Somehow this year, homeschooling two young kids and with an 18 month old, somehow all that had gotten done. And it was like December 9. And I just was feeling like, this is so great. I've got all this stuff done. I can just enjoy this Christmas season. And the more that I was just thinking about that as I'm watching my kids play and thinking, you know, I wonder if that was, that wasn't my incredible capacity. I wonder if that was the Lord preparing us for a new baby in our home during Christmas. And he knew that I really wouldn't have time this Christmas. And we talked about it. We ended up calling back and saying, yes, we'll, we'll take that baby. And so Beckham came to our house that afternoon. And that started for me a, a journey I never could have imagined where it would take me, not just a change of, of my heart and of just radically reshaping the way that I understood addiction and people struggling with addiction, even broader than that. What are we doing with drugs? What are we doing with people who use drugs? What are we doing with the market for drugs? How is that impacting vulnerable children and families? So Beckham for me was kind of this, uh, you know, I thought I was just going to foster this little baby for a little while until his mom was able to regain custody. And he ended up becoming the the beginning of something that completely changed my life. Interesting that a baby would change your life. Mm -hmm. Especially during Christmas time. Just, I don't there know. You go. Yep. I don't know if anybody's put that together yet, but I just did. <laughs> 
We'll let that sit on the table for a second. But for me, again, just getting into you and who you are, I just think there's something powerful that needs to maybe be shared that I know, and you know this, but but maybe others don't. In the state of Mississippi, help me with this so I don't mess it up, but in the state of Mississippi, if a mother gives birth while on drugs, what happens to the baby again? Almost universally, the baby will be removed from her custody and put into foster care. There's generally no thought given to what's the situation, what is the potential impact of that removal to to the bonding experience of a mom and a baby. You know, is the mom trying to get sober? Is she in treatment? That sort of thing. It's just sort of an automatic, this is a bad mother, put them in foster care, let her try to fight to get them back. What an uphill climb for a mom. Now, you mentioned your boys. How many are, are biological. Yeah, my oldest two I gave birth to, and then our third son, we ended up adopting. Uh, he was our first placement in foster care and, and ended up becoming a permanent part of our family and a, a wonderful blessing. And then we ado- and then we had Beckham for just a short time. And then we fostered one more little boy. Also, he was one month old when he came to us and he was with us for his first two years of life and has been back with his birth family now for the last four years. So that's been a, a separate journey, a lot of grief in that journey. We have no contact contact with that family. They have chosen not to send us pictures, videos, no contact at all. And so it's it's like he's dead, although he's still alive. You know, we treated him as though he were one of us for, for two years. So that's been a hard journey for my boys as well. To them, it is, it is losing a brother who was, you know, a baby when he came and two when he left. Another kind of, of grief and learning experience of how do you walk through that as somebody who's used to having a lot of voice in my life and being able to kind of make things happen. And here I am in a situation where I'm voiceless in that situation. I I don't have any say in what happens and whether or not we get contact and whether we get pictures. And I think that's probably had a lot to do with what has sort of catalyzed me to use the voice that I do have related to what I learned on that journey with Beckham and his mom, Joanne, especially. So she, after she gave birth to him, he came to us and she had one visit with him before she went to inpatient treatment to try to regain custody of him was part of what the, the judge had ordered for her. So she came and did that one visit with him. That was the first time I'd ever actually taken a child to a a visit. Our first foster son had not had visits up to that point. And so that was a new experience for me. I, you know, I I pulled into the parking lot at the child welfare office and I popped his car seat out of my car and I turned around and there is Joanne Beckham's mom. And she's running across the parking lot towards me. Like this is not somebody who's just like proud and, you know, I'm not going to let you see how I really feel. She is sprinting across the parking lot and she's weeping and she comes over and kisses Beckham. And I'm just standing there awkwardly holding his car seat, wondering what on earth is going on. Because in my mind, a mom who used drugs while she was pregnant doesn't love her child. That's just like, how, how can those things go together? I don't understand addiction, but certainly I understand love. And so I think, you know, there's no way that she could love him. And so she spent her one hour of time with him. I'll never forget coming back to pick him up after that one hour visit and walking into that teeny tiny, I mean, it's probably like eight foot by eight foot visitation room room in the child welfare office. And there's one couch that spans the entire side of one of the rooms. It's that small. And she's sitting there with him sleeping on her shoulder. The look on her face of her just drinking in, being able to touch him and talk to him and feed him just for one hour. It just was really heartbreaking in a way. But at that time, it just felt kind of like confusing. Like, I don't even know what to do with this. What? What's happening here? And after she left and went to treat we had those same similar kind of experiences that kept happening. She would call me and ask me to put her on speakerphone and she would sing to him over the phone. And it just was this, this dissonance kept happening between these things I've always believed about people like Joanne and then what I was actually seeing from Joanne and realizing over time, the more that I got to know her, that she's a mom like me and she loves her son just as much as I love my three boys. And she's also struggling with this complex health crisis. It's not a crisis of love. It's not a crisis of being a, a, a mother who wants the best for her child. She desperately wanted to be free of her addiction. She wanted to be there for him. And she let me see that in such a vulnerable way that let me walk in her shoes. I will forever be indebted to her for that. She could have not done that. She could have said, who are you that the government thinks you're a better mom who doesn't even know my son and is just going to swoop in here and try to parent him when I'm the one who gave birth to him and I'm the one who loves him. And she didn't do that. She let herself be so vulnerable and so 
open and let me see the brokenness of her own heart and the struggle in her life in a way that let me see myself in her. And when I saw that, it, it kind of brought me to this reckoning point of not just how have I misunderstood people dealing with what she's dealing with. And that broke my heart. It was very convicting to me. I would have said I was a very empathetic person, but it was empathetic for certain groups of people. I can see that now. I couldn't see that at the time that, that the empathy cut off very easily for different groups of people where I felt like they didn't deserve my empathy. And instead, it was kind of this heart change that was happening, but also I really started to feel this sick feeling knowing we're putting people like Joanne in prison all the time for this same thing. Mississippi has the second highest incarceration rate in the country. We put a lot of people in jail and prison for drug-related crimes. It's the vast majority of things that people get picked up on is something related to to drugs. And that started me on this journey of learning, wait a second, if if Joanne's a mom like me, who's struggling with a complex health crisis, and clearly this isn't going to be good for her or her son if she's in prison, drugs are readily available there. It's not going to help her deal with her addiction. And it's going to break this bond between this mom and child. And what's that going to do for Beckham as he grows up? That really started me on this journey of learning what what's the bigger picture of what we're doing with drugs and how can can it help people like Joanne and Beckham instead of further compound harm to them? And that's what's ended up changing my mind about how we handle drugs, changing my career, what I do with my life, changing my family. It has truly changed me, that journey of learning. Fantastic. I, I'm so glad you told that story, to be honest with you. I was really hoping we were going to get there because... I say often on our show, you know, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. And when I first came up with that, I thought, man, that's super catchy. That's kind of fun. It's super fun to say. But then when you're when you're put into the fire of having to defend that or having to walk that out, it's a whole different ball game. It is a whole different ball game. Part of our marketing, I, I've made bracelets. I wear them every day. And I work in a retail environment where people are awful. <laughs> Let's just face it. People in retail right now, high five you. I want to hug you all. Like we'll have a retail convention and I just want to go around and hug people because people are mean nowadays. They are awful and they're rude and they don't care and they want my way and you're going to help me now and demand things. And I'm so often reminded when I look down or I'm helping somebody and I look down at my wrist and I'm like, yep, different perspective. You, know, you need to remember different perspective. I have to remind myself of that because again, I think you and I are, are in a sense kindred spirits in some respects because there are certain people that I can give empathy to a whole lot easier. Our African-American community, just as an example, I can give empathy. I got friends that are black. Like I can relate with them. I've been around them when one of them has been called the N-word. I can relate with that. But as a man, I'm going to maybe be a little sexist here. I can't relate as a mom. Like I just can't. I just mm, can't go there. I'm not, I don't know what that feels like. But think back to when your boys were born. I, I don't care if you want to pick the youngest or the oldest. I vote young, youngest because I'm the youngest. But think back when the boys were born. Can you imagine just for a second if somebody had come in and like snatched them away from you right after you gave birth to them? No real chance to, in your words, bond, connect, have that mom moment. The Bible talks about Mary thought about all these things and treasured them often when she talked about Jesus. Jesus. And I imagine everybody laughed like the, the shepherds left. Everybody laughed and it's just her and Jesus and the baby, you know, and Joseph's probably asleep because he's exhausted and dudes sleep. We just sleep a lot. But moms, they stay awake, you know, they're vigilant. But it does say she took all those things and treasured them in her heart forever. And imagine just being her. What that would have been like for you. Can you maybe speak to that if that's not too weird? Yeah, I think that that has been one of the things, even even just broader than, you know, kind of changing my mind about how we handle drug policy in, in terms of how we think about foster care, how we think about families, how we think about what's best for a child. It's so easy to think, well, I am best for a child. My home is a great place. My, you know, we have two parents and we have a mom who stays home and it's here all the time. And we have educational options and we have you know, all of these things that as a, as a resource person in a first world country <laughs> with an education and all these things that I, I sort of, you know, quote unquote, have to offer. And we fail to recognize, I think a lot of times that God gives life and he gives it to whom he will give it to. Uh, that doesn't mean that it always happens that a child can stay in the home that they're born into. But that is a sacred trust, a sacred bond, something that we should be very, very hesitant 
to break or even interrupt. And I think that's part of what we, we've lost with the way that we have, and not just in Mississippi, but nationwide handled children born into family situation where a parent is struggling with addiction or mom is struggling with addiction. And I think we, we don't think about it that way. You know, I think about some of the things that Joanne did to kind of help me put myself in her shoes was, you know, she sent this little bear home to my house through the social worker with him. And the social worker brought it and she said, um, Joanne asked me to give this to you. And she asked me if you would snuggle it up next to Beckham while he was sleeping because she has kept it with her while he was in the NICU and she wants him to have her scent close to him while he's, he's, he still has that bonding thing. And so for me, I'm thinking, whoa, like that's the kind of thing me and my friends would do. Like we're all about the bonding. We're all about, you know, we don't want the babies taken back to the nursery in the hospital. We want them to be, you know, skin to skin contact, all this bonding stuff that, that me and my friends would talk about. And she's doing the same thing. She's trying to maintain that bond with him. And we know research tells us, we know children know who they're born to. They know whose mother they were in the womb of. They recognize her voice. They All of these things, they know when there's a break in that relationship. It has an impact on their development, on their attachment, all of these things. And I think you're spot on, Neil, to ask that question of, can we put ourselves in someone else's shoes? Can we feel what that would be like to have our own child taken away from us? Even if we had made bad decisions, can we feel that? And Joanne has, we've had the opportunity to kind of share our stories together. Sometimes we've done that for a couple of foster parent trainings, trying to help foster parents understand both sides of what it's like as a foster parent who's sort of trying to trying to support a, a relationship and also feels that tornness over, you know, is this child better off with me and from a mom. And she's talked about that, what that moment was like for her in the hospital to have her son taken away, to watch the social worker walk out the door. She just was telling me this last week. She said, I, I can tell you what her hair looked like as I watched her walk down the hallway with my son. And I couldn't go. And she didn't know us. She didn't know where he was going, if he was going to a good family or, or not. It was just a profound sense of loss for her. This feeling of, I have to get him back as quickly as possible. I, I, I must be near my son again. But she, she can go right back to that place of what that felt like. And if we can let ourselves, we can go to that place with her and with other people who are like her, not just people whose children are being taken away and put in foster care, but also for people who are going into the criminal justice system, people, what would that be like to be arrested? What would it be like to be separated from your family for children to grow up with a parent in jail? I went actually one day, I, w I went to go visit a woman that I knew who had been incarcerated and she was in jail awaiting sentencing. And so I went to the local jail. It's the only time I've ever done this. This isn't like, you know, part of my regular life. Look at me. I go visit the jail. I went that day was super uncomfortable. Like, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know how this works. And I go in and there's all these families. This is during school hours. So the one time you could go during the week to visit is during school hours. So families whose children were there had to skip school to come and visit. And there was a family there who, as I'm sitting there waiting for the visitation to start, everyone is talking together. They all recognize each other because they're there every week visiting their family members together. So the families get to know each other. There was a family there and they had four children that were almost exactly the same ages as my four children at that point. This was after Beckham. And so it's when we had our other fourth father. Foster son. It, you know, as I'm listening to what's happening, I realize their dad is incarcerated. They're there to visit him for the first time. And the oldest boy is about 10, probably. And the way that the visitation worked, you had to you had to walk into this little doorway and then you had to turn and go down a hallway. So you couldn't see where you were going and they would not let the adult that was there with the children go back with the children. Just the children had to go and walk down this little hallway where they couldn't see. So the, the boy, he kind of starts in. He's the first one who's going to go from that family. And he starts in and he gets there and he walks back and he says, I'm scared. You know, Neil, can we put ourselves in the shoes of these families and children? What is this like? For a family. For me, this goes back to, is this always avoidable? No. Sometimes the criminal justice system needs to come into play, but we use it for all sorts of issues. It is not the right tool for. It's not the right tool for people struggling with addiction. It's not the right tool for people who are in possession of a substance. That's the health crisis for them. That's a health concern. It's not a criminal justice concern. When we treat it that way, we are impacting these families, not just the person who's incarcerated, but their whole family. Now we can see 
say, well, it's that dad's fault. Whatever he did, he shouldn't have done. And then his kids wouldn't have that experience. Whatever that dad did is what he did. Now, he was probably awaiting sentencing, which means he may not have done anything. He might have been innocent and been arrested and had not been cleared yet. But for millions of people every year, that experience is on a drug charge or a drug arrest. And for them, let's just kind of walk that through. What would that be like for Joanne to get arrested for her for drug possession, for the addiction that she had? And she was using illegal drugs. She was using methamphetamines at that point. And so if she gets arrested, what does that do? Separates her from Beckham. It traumatizes her, disconnects her from employment, from housing, from economic opportunity when she comes back and she has a criminal record. All of those things get uh, wound up in this kind of cycle of trauma that happens. And what we know is that trauma is uh, one of the main drivers of drug use in the first place and addiction. And so we're actually using the criminal justice system to try to address an issue that's made worse by trauma. So we're using trauma to try to deal with trauma. And it is no wonder that this is not working, that we continue loading more and more people into jail and prison, and it doesn't deal with our addiction. And it, in many cases, only makes it worse because it is such a traumatic environment, not just for the people who are in there, but for their families. Children have to go to school every day, separated from their parents. That That's on us. That response is on us. The choice to use a substance is someone's personal choice. The choice to put them in jail is a choice we've made as a society. You're saying all this stuff. And, and I love what you're saying, by the way. I don't know if we're friends yet. I don't know if we're at that level yet. I hope we are. Totally friends. Okay, totally friends. Cool. Because with my friends, I can like push on like some of the stuff they're <laughs> Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. All, right. yep. all right, fair enough. So I don't know. Do you know this guy, Jeff Bezos? Have you you heard of this guy? Yeah. Familiar yep. with him? All right. I don't know if you know this. His net worth is $175.5 billion. $175.5 billion US dollars for our Indian friends across the pond. But if I gave you somehow, like I talked to Jeff, we're buddies. Him and I are BFFs. We play golf together a lot. A lot of, a lot of Carolina games together, I'm sure. But if I talked to Jeff and I was like, listen, Jeff, I know this gal in Mississippi. She's doing some amazing work. She just needs money like we all do. You know, she has this cause she wants to get excited about. And somehow I talked to Jeff and he cuts you a check for $75.5 billion. Is that enough money to, to change or to fix what you're talking about? Because to me, I think there has to be some consequences to people's actions, right? Yeah. But what's the answer? I mean, the answer isn't to take the kid, but the answer is to get him help. So help me with that. What is the answer? And maybe with Jeff Bezos' monies, we can figure out an answer. Because I do know go. this. Listen. It takes money to sometimes help a problem. It really, truly does. I mean, yeah. I, I hate to yeah. say it that way, but I truly believe that. God can do his part. Don't get me wrong. But I do think it takes yeah. funds and funding to create dramatic change. And I believe if you had that money, dramatic change would definitely take place. So if you had that, what would yeah. you do with that money? So I would go back to the source of where harm is coming from. And I think that's something that we have lost sight of. We see an outcome that's harmful and we say, let's just fight against that. And we don't we don't take the time to say, what's causing that? Are we actually addressing a root cause there of what's causing that harm. So if we were going to look at just consumers of substances, instead of focusing on the drug, that's how drug policy has worked. That's how largely most of our societal responses have been is to focus on the drug and say, we got to get rid of that drug. Instead of saying, why does somebody want to use that drug? What What's going on in their life that that drug is, a, is something that they want to do, that it's a, something they see as sort of a positive impact on their life? We don't do that. So earlier this week, I took in my car to the shop because the check engine light was on. Now, if I just went in and I said, hey, can you turn the check engine light off? They totally could have. So the indicator would be turned off, but the problem wouldn't be fixed. The check engine light is just an indicator that something else is going on. It's saying, hey, here's a little warning light. And that's how we need to think about substance use. We need to think about that as, hey, that's just an indicator. But what's the real thing? What's the real issue going on in someone's life? They want to change the way that they feel. Is it trauma from their childhood that they are numbing? Is it uh, loneliness? Is it a lack of purpose in their life? Is it, you know, when you start to listen to the reasons 
reasons people use drugs. It's very different from the cultural narrative of why people use drugs. Why do you use cocaine? Well, it makes me feel like like I matter, like I'm the king of the world. Like, okay, well, that's something we can understand. Who wouldn't want to feel like they were the king of the world, especially if they felt like they didn't matter before? That's an understandable feeling that people would want to pursue. Why do you use heroin? One person told me it gave me this intense sense of well-being. It felt like this warm, soft, enveloping hug. That's not part of the heroin narrative we hear that's crazy people want to be out there doing crazy stuff. These are understandable human experiences that we all pursue just in different ways, some in healthy ways and then sometimes in unhealthy ways. So we got to look at those root causes. So for consumers, that's going to be dealing with the root causes of loneliness and anxiety and depression and trauma. So when I look at trauma, then I say, where is trauma coming from? Sometimes it's coming from abuse of some sort. Sometimes it's coming from what I would say is the the response of criminalizing substances. So the vast majority of crime in our world today is caused by drug prohibition from forcing drugs underground. They get picked up by gangs and cartels and sold and produced that way, which means they're funding criminal activity. They're funding gangs and cartels now because they're the only ones that that can sell them because they're illegal. So when I think about the, the number of children who are growing up in unsafe neighborhoods, they're seeing violence on the streets. A lot of that violence, a lot of that crime comes from drug prohibition. So if we want to decrease the amount of trauma that children are experiencing as they grow up, decreasing the amount of drug activity that's happening on the streets, it's a big part of that. And the best way to do that is to remove drugs from the underground market so that they're not being fought over by gangs and cartels anymore and bring them back into some sort of legal access like we did with alcohol. You know, we prohibited alcohol. There's lots of violence, alcohol related violence from the underground alcohol market. When we legalized alcohol again, that violence went away and we have you know liquor stores on the corner. It doesn't mean alcohol doesn't harm people, just that prohibiting it didn't work. And it led to a lot of unintended collateral damage of crime and violence. And I would love to see when I look at kind of harm across humanity, there's all these different ways that harm happens, but a lot of harm is coming from a criminalized drug market that's creating a lot of crime. It also leads to a lot of overdose deaths. The vast majority of people dying from overdose deaths today are people who got a drug on the street that was unregulated. It was contaminated. They didn't know what they were taking or how strong it was. And they're dying not from the drug, but from the contamination and the lack of regulation that they had in taking that drug. So you got to think about the trickle down effect of that trauma. We lost 100,000 people last year to an overdose. A lot of those people had children. They have brothers and sisters. They have moms and dads. And now all of those family structures have experienced this nuclear bomb of trauma from losing their loved one. When I look at incarceration for a consumer, when I look at crime from an underground market, when I look at overdose deaths from contaminated substances, there is trauma trauma, trauma, trauma at every level. And if we really want to address substance use, we have to address trauma. Unfortunately, the way we have handled drugs is to increase trauma at every level. And for me, that's what ended up changing my mind about pursuing drug prohibition, which is what I had supported, you know, tough on drugs laws. We just got to, you know, we got to send a message. We got to lock people up. And instead saying, no, the criminal justice system is actually creating a lot more trauma. It actually is. We need to handle this as a health issue not a criminal justice issue if we want to see less trauma, better outcomes, fewer people dying, fewer families torn apart. Okay, so I may be way off base here, but from what I'm hearing you say, legalize everything, legalize heroin, legalize methamphetamine? So if I would say yes in some way, now, sometimes you need different kinds of regulatory structures. Because I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand this. So one of my musical heroes was Kurt Cobain. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember Kurt. Had this little band yeah, in Nirvana. Yeah, just a little band. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody's probably heard of them. Nirvana. No, nah, not, a, not a thing. But my understanding is, the narrative is at least, I'm going to tell the narrative that people are telling, not, not my personal belief in this, because that gets into conspiracies and rabbit holes and all that stuff. The narrative is he got high on heroin and, and took his life. I'm just using Kurt as the example. No kidding involved. I mean, there's some trauma obviously there from Kurt's life. I mean, how else does he go do heroin? I mean, to me, that's like trauma, like something happened there. From what I'm hearing you say, if heroin had been legal, maybe Kurt doesn't overdose.
gross. I know that's a big hypothetical, but in your mind, maybe can we go there? Yeah. So I'm not, I don't know about his situation in particular, but if you look at what people have in their bodies when they're overdosing today, so if you look at just opioids and people think opioid overdoses, this is causing, this is coming from doctors who are prescribing too much. People are taking too much and dying. Almost 85% of people who died of an opioid overdose last year had fentanyl in their bodies. Fentanyl is, it's been around forever. It's been used in hospitals for decades. It's found its way onto the underground market in a powdered form, way more potent than morphine is, which means that the the risk factor, you know, between getting high and dying, it's a pretty razor thin margin in terms of potency and purity of the substance. And so people are are dying from, from fentanyl overdoses, not because fentanyl on its own is so particularly deadly, but because it is a very potent substance. And when you take a potent substance and you put it out on the street where there's no regulatory control over it, you end up having people that think they're going to get high and end up dying. Here's a good example of why fentanyl itself is, is used all the time. It doesn't kill people. So my youngest son was four. He cut his finger really badly. We had to take him to the ER to get stitches put in it. Get there and this nurse comes in. She's got this dropper and she says, hey, I'm going to give him some fentanyl and that's going to help with the pain. Now, you know, I'm already doing the work that I do today, which is inviting people into this conversation of changing from a criminal justice approach to a public health approach. I know people are dying from fentanyl all the time. And these are 40 year old men, not four year old little boys. And she's giving him pure fentanyl. Now, how can she do that? She came in a couple hours later and did it again. I'm getting, hey, I'm going to give him some more fentanyl, you know, right before they put the stitches in. So a four-year-old can get fentanyl in a legal regulated environment and it helps him. But a 40 year old can get fentanyl on the street and it kills them. It's not fentanyl, it's how they're accessing it and whether or not it is able to be regulated, dosed appropriately, or whether it's just a Russian roulette of you don't know how strong is it gonna be. Even if people are trying to be careful if they're using a loan, it's very easy to miss dose or not even know. I mean, think about that, Neil, if you get if you get a little baggie of powder, now I've never used illegal drugs. So this is hypothetical for me. (laughs) If you get a little baggie of drugs on the street, you're totally guessing what's in that. How potent is it? How much of it is fentanyl? How much is heroin? How much is baby powder? How much is brick dust? How uh, You just have no clue what's in that bag that you just bought. So you are using what you think is going to be an appropriate amount to get high, but it's a guess. It's a total guess. I feel like I sort of backed into this position of trying to figure out, okay, how do we get less people dying, less families destroyed and less harm related to drugs and ended up as I kind of looked at where the harm is coming from, that's what ended up changing my my mind. So it's kind of, for me, it's this sort of uncomfortable position in that I don't want my kids using drugs. I don't want other people using drugs. And yet the prohibition of drugs has led to just catastrophic loss of human life and destruction of families and all of this harm. So as somebody who cares about life, that's why I care about drug policy, because really I see it as this is people policy. What we do with drugs is what we do with people. And I want to see more people being able to live to their full potential. Does heroin in some sort of legal form uh, make me nervous? Absolutely it does. And yet heroin on the street is terrifying and that's what's happening to us today so it's it's not a it's not sort of a a perfect versus imperfect it's a what's a realistic path for us in a world where there's drugs in a world where there's pain where people want to change the way that they feel what's a realistic path for us that is going to get us the least amount of harm the best possibility for outcomes joanne today is doing great she's been sober since beckham was a baby and that doesn't always happen though We know it doesn't happen if she's sitting in prison. We know what that outcome is. It is a destroyed family. It's a life that's going to be very difficult to rebuild. So we have an option. If her substance use is handled in a a health-centered way, she has a chance to come out of that, to be able to find sobriety, or at least a chance to stay alive until she can find sobriety. And that, I think, is something we have to grapple with, too, that you can't force someone to stop using as much as we want to think that we can. You can talk to any family member who has ever had an addicted loved one, and they'll tell you, oh, we've tried everything. We've yelled and screamed at them. We've taken everything away. We've cut them off. We brought them back. We let them live with us. We threw them out. We've tried everything, and it didn't work. And I think that is maybe one of the core things that we have to to deal with. And it's probably particularly difficult for people in Western society where we're used to having a big voice in things and we can kind of make things happen is that we cannot force people to stop, but we can provide the widest path of available options 
for them to quit and we can do everything we can to keep them alive and healthy with the best life they can have until they're able to get to that point. For some people that may not ever happen for them. And I think then we we have to be willing to say, can we give up the dream of this quantum leap from active addiction, crazy town to thriving life, amazing family, working 40 hours a week at a nine to five job. That's kind of what we do right now. We say, can you make that quantum leap? The reality is that most of humanity doesn't make quantum leaps. We make small steps one at a time. So could we shift to thinking, how can we reduce harm from this person's addiction to their family, to their community and help them just one step at a time, want to take those steps towards a thriving life? And how can we do the most important thing first, which is keeping them alive? Once they're dead, the opportunity is over. How can we keep them alive and give them options to make better choices so that over time they can regain a thriving life, which is, I think, the goal we all want. I just think that's so impactful to, to think about. And, and honestly, that's a little bit of a, a shift for me to think about that because I know in our community in Southern Oregon, I could throw a rock in any kind of shopping center and probably hit a marijuana dispensary. I mean, they're everywhere because I think, I mean, I mean somebody will have to correct me on this, but I think marijuana is now legal in Oregon, you can like go there and you can, you know, get it mm-hmm. dispensed to you. But to your point, I mean, I would never do this, but if I found somebody on the street that was like, Hey, I need to get some, you know, I, I don't even know the right terminology to say here, but Hey, right. can I score some weed? I feel so inept in this conversation right now, but you know, who knows what they're giving me, right? Who knows what they've laced it with? Who knows if there's shrooms in it, which I know that's a hallucinogenic. I know a little bit, but not much, but to your point, I, I think, but I don't know if the answer is to make everything just right across the board. Let's make it all legal and who's going to govern that? Is the government going to come in and, and take control over that? Are they going to tax it? Well, you should got to think they're already doing that for other substances, you know, alcohol, tobacco. Oh, hundred percent. They are hundred percent. They are. Yes. No. Marijuana is, is, is next. Just wait. Those of you with dispensaries, just wait. The government likes to get involved. But I think that's a, it's a good point because it is difficult for us to kind of think through like, wow, what, how could that even work? What would that even look like? Uh, none of us have ever lived in the time where those substances were legal, even though they used to be all is cocaine, heroin. They used to be legal. They used to be sold. The most popular form of heroin back 100 years ago was heroin that was sold over the counter in a soothing syrup that was, you know, if you dealt with anxiety, you could go to your local pharmacy and get this soothing syrup and it had heroin in it. Now, did did some people develop problematic use of that? Yes, but the vast majority of them didn't. It was just used when they had a, a really stressful day or something like that. It, it would be hard for the entire world prior to 100 years ago to imagine using the criminal justice system to deal with substances. It was a really radical shift in substance policy when we started it in the U.S. 100 years ago. But it's for us now, it feels radical to go back to that, even though that was how we handled substances for millennia the world over was, no, this is this is not a criminal justice issue. This is a, a social issue. It's a family issue. It's a health issue, a spiritual issue, but not something that we we try to kind of use the criminal justice system to to handle. And yet I do think there is a role for government to, to adequately regulate substances like they do with alcohol and tobacco, setting age restrictions on purchase. You can go to your liquor store and you know exactly the proof of whatever it is that you're buying. It's not just a a willy nilly. I don't know. You know, you you know that. And so and we also have things like prescriptions. We kind of already have these regulatory systems set up for other substances, whether it's prescriptions or on site, like a bar where you can buy alcohol on site, but you can't take it off site. There are places in other parts of the world that do that with heroin for heroin addicted people. You can come and, and use it pure medical grade heroin on site under the care of a doctor, but you can't take it home with you. And they found that that has been the most successful form of treatment for heroin to kind of remove people from that, the crazy town of getting it on the street, bringing them into medical care and saying, hey, you're safe here. You can come and use heroin here and we want to help you build a thriving life, whatever that looks like for you. Can we help you find a job? Can we help you find housing? They are dealing with it in a way that says, let's get the heroin off the table because that's not really the real problem. The problem is what's driving your heroin use, which is who knows, all sorts of other things. I heard somebody make a, an illustration. They said, you know, if you if you go to someone who's addicted to heroin and you say, we're just going to take that away from you, we, we just have to remove that heroin from your life. It's like dumping the cup out. Nobody can 
can live with an empty cup. What needs to happen is that their cup fills up with other things where the heroin isn't needed anymore. But our response now is kind of to say, we're going to dump your cup out first. And then we're, we hope that you can kind of fill that cup up. And a lot of other countries are now saying, what if we kind of did those things simultaneously? What if we said, let's fill your cup up removing the chaos from you being on the street, help you build that thriving life. And what they found is that even though they don't force people to stop taking heroin, that people on their own almost universally choose to take less and less of it and eventually stop using it as they're able to build this life that they want to be fully present for. So it's a shift away from focusing on the drug towards focusing on why are people using it? And only when you address those things and help people return meaning and purpose and belonging and value in their life life and healing from trauma. That's what helps people to be able to regulate and decrease substance use. All right. Last analogy. But I know for me as a kid, we had a cookie jar. Maybe you guys have one too. You know, in the kitchen, it was prominent. You know, as a kid, I knew exactly how many cookies were in said cookie jar, maybe because I counted them a few times and then put them back. But there was a rule. You can only have one cookie. I know there were times I snuck more than one and it felt good sneaking that extra cookie. Like until my mom figured out we were sneaking cookies and then she started counting the cookies again. And so it was a thing. But to me, if she had just said, listen, you can have a cookie from, you know, 7 p.m. to, you know, 830. That's your cookie window. That's it. At night after dinner, if you're good, you you get this. I, I don't think I would have snuck the cookie because it was more exciting, you know, like espionage and, you know, cloak and dagger to like sneak in there and get the cookie and eat it before she, you know, noticed. But if she just made it available to me, the thrill would have been gone of sneaking the cookie, right? I know it's a terrible analogy perhaps, but I think that's that's what I hear you saying. that is that if we make it available during this certain window, this certain regulation, okay, you can come during this time, cookies will be available, as silly as it sounds, then there's no sneaking around there's no where am i gonna get my next fix for my cookie because i like cookies i really do I like oreos they're my favorite double stuffed hello oreos you want to send me some cookies i'm okay with that am i hearing you right in that still I, I i still feel like i'm struggling a little bit i think there is some level of that i mean i think there's research out there that says when we're told we can't have something we want we want it more <laughs> that's like a legitimate human that's a real thing that's my real yeah, thing i don't know it if is it's a real, real or thing. not but that is my real <laughs> it thing is a real so, yeah thing. i i'm an expert in that for sure yes, yes. it is a real thing. Now, I would still say for kids and drugs, we still have to say you can't have them. Now, are some kids going to go and use drugs anyway? Sure they are. I just had an email yesterday from somebody that said using drugs when I was 13 and it was always easier for me to go and buy heroin than it was to buy alcohol because heroin was everywhere. I mean, there was no age restrictions on heroin purchase. You, you're 13. You can buy it as easily as when you're 33. It's on the street. There's no incentive for someone who's selling heroin not to sell to a 13 year old. Whereas with alcohol, the vast majority of the alcohol market is an adult market. Liquor stores don't want to risk their liquor license to sell to a 13 year old who walks in. Now, can a 13 year old still get alcohol? Well, sure, but they've got to find somebody with an older brother, or somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody at the corner store or whatnot. And so his experience of using was that illegal drugs were more available to him than legal drugs were. I was talking to another guy who has struggled with opioid addiction. And he said, you know, he never felt like he fit in with sort of mainstream culture. And when he started using, using drugs in high school, it gave gave him like this sort of culture to be part of that was underground. It was, you know, the, the people stealing the cookies, if you will, you know, it was the, you know, people who are doing something they're not supposed to be doing, but that continued even after he would have been legal age in other States to purchase marijuana or his experience in the underground drug culture was working his way up the ladder. So first you can just use the marijuana, but then after a while you can maybe ride with somebody who's going to buy the marijuana. You don't get to buy it yet. You don't get to know who sells it yet. Okay. Well then if you work your way up and build some more trust, you can become the one to go buy it. And then if you work your way up some more, you can figure out where they're buying it from. And then if you build more trust, you can become the one to sell it. So for him, it was this sense of belonging in this whole hierarchy of structure. And that structure was created by prohibition. We just don't have that structure for alcohol. Nobody's selling alcohol on the street corner and developing a, a massive business plan around alcohol distribution on the street. It just doesn't, nobody wants to buy it from some guy on the street. They want to go to their local liquor store and buy the thing they really want. There is so much of the way that we experience drugs 
that is so much a part of that, of prohibition. It's hard for us to see outside of that. But I think we would be doing our children a much better service to put drugs behind counters where they are legally regulated, where it's harder for them to access them because you have to have an ID rather than dealers who aren't checking ID. But also, let's say they do get a hold of those drugs. Let's say let's say heroin is behind a counter somewhere in some sort of well-regulated environment and they get a hold of that. At least they will be getting a hold of something that is quality controlled, that we know how much is actually in whatever the dose that they're taking is, whether it's a pill or something like that. They don't have that right now. They're accessing it easily and they're accessing far more deadly versions of the drugs than they would be if they were getting, you know, like they do with alcohol. Kids aren't accessing moonshine right now. They're, they're still getting legally controlled beer, or, you know, wine or liquor, whatever they're drinking. At least they know what they are drinking if they do get it. Now, I don't want anyone's kids drinking. I don't want my kids drinking until they're of legal age. There's this kind of two things. One is that right now drugs are readily available to them, no matter what age they are. And that's not just somebody who wants drug policy reform talking. That's that's on the pamphlets of the drug control agencies of the United States. They say themselves, drugs are readily available to our youth. They acknowledge that. They know that to be true. So if drugs are readily available to our youth today, fear over what is the signaling to our kids, I'm, I'm more concerned about what is it signaling to our kids that they're watching as we continue to respond to substance use with putting people in jail? How, how is that showing them the way that we are meeting people where they are, trying to put ourselves in their shoes, trying to figure out what's really causing this. And it's just absolutely heartbreaking when you kind of drill down into the lives of real people and see, gosh, they are already dealing with so much pain, shame, trauma, hopelessness. And now we're adding more to that. So I totally get it. So, you know, Neil, you and I are talking for, you know, what, an hour or something like that. For me, this was like a two year process for people listening who are like, I don't don't know. Maybe, maybe some things I can connect to. And maybe this sounds like absolutely crazy. That was totally how I thought as well. The first time I ever heard legalizing drugs, I literally was so angry. I just like got up and left the room. I thought this is so insane. How can you say that? I'm, you're a Christian, you know, I'm, I'm conservative. This is crazy. We, we care about people. Why would we even be talking about that? And I would say now on this side of this learning journey of where harm is coming from that I didn't change my mind about about drug policy because I changed my values. I think my values actually lead me to a different conclusion, a different set of policies that I think actually better uphold the value of life than the ones that I had supported before. And I can hold that intention. I'm I'm advocating for not using the criminal justice system for drugs, allowing them to come back into the legal economy again. And yet I don't want people using the things kind of like adultery. I don't want people engaging in that. It's incredibly harmful, sinful as a Christian. And yet I also don't want people being thrown in prison for that all the time either. That's just that's the wrong response for it. And that's kind of the same sort of tension that I hold here is just because I'm, I don't think something is healthy or I don't think it's good for you. Or some people would say, you know, it's categorically sinful doesn't mean that it's criminal. You know, the 10 commandments, most of them aren't even criminal. And yet we have continued to kind of use the criminal justice system for drugs in a way that I think has actually created an immense amount of harm and made it a lot harder for people to build thriving lives. Well, yeah. I mean, just imagine if your internet history was yeah. criminal, a lot yeah. of us would be going to jail right now for searching penguins and North Carolina <laughs> stuff. So, Well, awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really do appreciate it. I hope you've had fun today. I, I hope it's been exciting for you. I love the perspective shift. I really do, because that's what it's all about. And I think right now, there is a shadow of death over our country right now with this drug mm. addiction. Yes. Agree or disagree? Agree. And it doesn't have to be that way. I think that's that's my hope for people. This is not a foregone conclusion. It's not something we can't do anything about. We can see what's causing it and we can take action to save lives. Absolutely. So how can people get in touch with you? Yeah. So I'm I'm across social media platforms at Christina B. Dent. Also, our organization, End It For Good, is cross platforms as well at End It For Good MS. I ended up changing my mind 
starting an organization. There's four of us that work full-time now at End It For Good. We do a lot of this advocacy work, inviting people into conversation, answering questions, having dialogue, agreeing, disagreeing. We do events all over Mississippi and do speaking engagements all over the place. So yeah, you can connect with us there. You can also go to our website at enditforgood.com. If you go to enditforgood.com slash get started, if you're kind of in that like curious stage of, okay, maybe there's something here and I'm curious enough to learn, go to enditforgood.com slash get started. And there's a couple of different options options for ways that you can just learn a little bit more. One of them's reading a book. One of them's watching. I did a TED talk a couple of years ago that shares this story in a succinct form. And you can kind of see some visuals along with that that help illustrate it. It's great ways to get connected there. So come join us over on the website. Join us over on social media. You can always email me, Christina, at enditforgood.com. You can tell me all the things you think are wrong about what Neil and I have been talking about. I would love to have that conversation with you. Um, let's have a dialogue. I am not afraid of disagreement or concern. And I'm not going to tell you you're wrong. I want to have dialogue. I want to understand where you're coming from and just provide what I can to kind of provide a different perspective. So come join us over there. We, we want people to get connected and join this journey. Well, I couldn't find my Mississippi State Cup, so I had to use this amazing North Carolina Cup. We're going to play a game together because I know as a boy mom, you've probably played a lot of games oh, in your oh, life. Oh, so true. Amazing. Yep. Right? I, I just Still know do. that from my from other moms that I've had on that are boy moms. So we play this game at the end of our show. It's called Senseless, and it's just a, a fun way we end things. I'm going to roll for you. Are, are you comfortable with that? Absolutely. I don't know how we're going to make it work if you weren't, but, but anyway, there we are. So I'm going to roll on your behalf. Here we go. And you have this amazing number one. I know it's a North Carolina logo, but I promise it's a number one. So it's interesting because I, I do think this is uber creepy all the time when it happens. And it happens actually quite a bit. And that's this question because it kind of relates to what we're talking about. It's weird how the game like knows what we've been. It's I don't know. It's a Jesus moment. I don't know. It's probably the game. Here's the question for senseless. It's this. How do you want others to see you? Hmm. That's a great question. I hope when they see me, and I do a lot of kind of public work now, I want them to see the heart of Jesus. And I don't say that because I think that all Christians have to agree on drug policy. I would hope that whether or not they agree on where we need to go with drug policy and how we handle drugs and addiction, that they would see that the heart I'm coming from, the heart that I want to see reflected in the world is the heart of Jesus who is able to meet people where they are, to make people feel his love and compassion and mercy. You know, oftentimes I have a friend who explains how Jesus often when you see his pattern of interaction with people that brings transformation, it is humility first, like people coming to him in a humble state, kind of bringing their nothing, if you will. And then he extends mercy. Then there's a call to action. And we often flip that around. We, we have this call to action first and we sort of dangle our mercy out there. It's like, when you get your act together, then I'm going to meet you with mercy. And when we see Jesus's response to people, we see he fronts mercy uh, when they come to him in humility. And then the transformation of action and change in their life comes after they have received the mercy of Jesus. And I, I hope that as people see me out doing public things related to this work, that they would see that heart, that heart of mercy, of drawing near to people, of wanting people to draw near into relationship. That would be an incredible honor if people saw that in me and even the broken way that it could be. Jesus's was perfect. Mine will never be anything close to that. But I hope that they can say, even if I disagree, she is a follower of Jesus and she wants him to be glorified most of all. I love that answer. That was, that was beautiful. Well, Christina, again, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Neil. This is so fun to do. I love all your questions. I love where, where we went. I've shared a bunch of stories I've never shared on any other podcast. So this is awesome. Guys and gals, kids and campers alike it is that sad time that i always get sad about we say goodbye to a guest but don't say goodbye to the guest continue the conversation listen i love the show for this very reason i don't always agree with people and i'm not gonna say i totally agree with christina i'm not gonna say i think she's crazy or people in mississippi we've never had them on before so now we got craziness going on in mississippi but stop pump the brakes for just a second put it in park is what she's saying have value is what she's saying causing you to maybe rethink what you've always thought about Nancy Reagan's just say no to drugs? Is that causing you to maybe have some turmoil, some tension? If it is, thank you, Christina, for that. I love that. And I want you to think about that this week. Is what is something you've thought about for a long time that you might be wrong in? 
because I truly believe this. We don't say that phrase. I might be wrong. I might be wrong in this. Now, there are some things I know I'm not wrong about. I know I'm not wrong about being a Duke fan. I know that for a fact, but I can maybe concede that they are a good team sometimes. And sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes we need to concede a point to say, you know what? I might have always looked at this from a wrong perspective. And if you've done that today, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. OPSpodcast.com is a great place to do that. There, of course, is a connections page there. There's even a voicemail there. You, of course, can connect with us on the social media's OPS Podcast Show on our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And guys, let me tell you, just take that moment this week to really sit down and ask yourself, what have I been wrong? What do I need to change that perspective? Do that this week. And if you do, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. Do not forget this. Don't ever forget. Remember, when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned until next week when we walk in other people's shoes.